Hi, my name is Wei Song. I'm the presenter for Poster Timeline for DMF Risk Based Assessment. The first question we received is What is the tentative timeline for receiving the no further comments letter from receipt of first adequate letter? The answer is There is no timeline between receiving the no further comments letter and receiving the first adequate letter. The mechanism for issuing these two letters is different. The purpose of sending the first adequate letter is to notify the DMF holder that the DMF is found adequate to support the referenced applications it is triggered when the DMF review is finalized and typically issued within 30 days of the final DMF review. The NFC letter is triggered by the approval action on the referencing application. Our target is to issue this NFC letter within 30 days of the approval. The second question we received is, can the DMF risk-based assessment be initiated before an ANDA is filed after the DMF fee is paid? This may help in time saving and meeting the timeline. The answer is, well, we believe that starting the DMF review earlier would be a benefit to the application review process. At present, the FDA does not have the resources to initiate reviews of drug master files without a filed referencing application submission. Quite simply, we can't expand review results reviewing DMFs not associate with goal days at the expense of the DMFs that are associated with the open applications with goal days. Hi, my name is Gianni Pereira, and this question is from poster number two on the topic of completeness assessments and asks, Though guidelines are available on DMF and respective filing of ANDA, I would like to understand whether the ANDA applicant can file the ANDA before having the DMF completeness assessment. Can we file DMF with data and fees and ANDA with data and fees in parallel, or should we wait for CA and then file the ANDA? Gajufa does allow for submission of the DMF and payment of the DMF fee in parallel with the submission of the referencing application. And therefore, technically speaking, the ANDA can be submitted prior to the DMF having the completeness assessment. However, the ANDA cannot be filed without the DMF achieving available for reference status, which requires that the DMF pass the CA. For this reason, submitting the application when the DMF has not yet passed a CA and appears on the available for reference list is a high-risk submission strategy that increases the likelihood the application could be refused to receive. FTA strongly encourages the DMF holder to submit a complete DMF and pay the DMF fee at least six months prior to the submission of the ANDA or a prior approval supplement that will rely on the DMF. This allows time for multiple cycles of CA should they be needed to pass before application submission. If the DMF and fee are submitted or no about the time of application submission, then there is typically only time for one cycle of CA review before the filing decision is made and if the DMF were to fail the CA, the application would be refused to receive. Note that historically only about 50% of DMFs pass a CA after one cycle. 
but that over 93% of DMFs pass a CA when a second cycle is performed. So having time for more than one cycle is very helpful to the application filing process. Industry has been following FDA advice to submit the DMF and pay the fee well before the planned application submission date, which has resulted in a decreasing trend in the number of applications receiving a refuse to receive action because the DMF was not available for reference. For example, in fiscal year 2020, there was only one refuse to receive caused by the DMF out of over 800 original applications submitted. Thank you. Hi, my name is Steve Kinsley, and my question is, what are the most common reasons for the low, below 4% adequate rate for first cycle reviews of original DMFs? Well, in answer to that question, there are several reasons for the adequacy rate for the first cycle reviews of DMS. First of all, let's just look at the major deficiencies. And out of the major deficiencies that we cite in the first cycle, 80% of these deficiencies are associated with the impurity controls and qualification controls. This would be under ICH guidelines Q3A, Q3C, and ICHM7. So this is going to be the bulk of our major requests, and again, leading to many of our uh, inadequacies in the first cycle. The other common reasons for first cycle inadequacy include the selection of starting materials, which you can look in ICHQ11, which will give you guidelines there, or an incomplete validation of analytical techniques. And this would be ICHQ2, or also looking at the USP uh, 621. And in both of these cases, these are just things that can be done ahead of time. These are things which we try to do in our completeness assessments so you get feedback before you submit. But still, once these are submitted, if these types of deficiencies are there, we have to uh, have the first cycle inadequate. Now, as far as the other reasons, and an excellent pair of presentations to look at to help you prepare better uh, DMFs is uh, one of the presentations is common CMC issues in type 2 DMFs and how to avoid them. And the other is major deficiencies and facility issues in type 2 DMFs. So thank you very much for your question and uh, have a good day. Hi, my name is Commander Dave Skanke and this question is from poster number four on the topic of facility information in DMF form 3938 and asks, in the example, FDA drug master file form 3938 asks that every establishment related to the DMF confirm whether or not they are ready to be inspected by FDA. While this question appears to be applicable for type 2 master files where facilities must also have drug establishment registrations, it does not appear to be applicable for type 3, 4, and possibly 5 master files. If the facility does not have an applicable FDA registration, such as a drug establishment, BTA, medical device registration, etc. How should they respond to the question of whether or not the facility is ready for FDA inspection? In order to be able to complete and sign the form, it is necessary to completely fill out the fields related to establishment number and readiness for inspection when an establishment is entered. If the facility does not have an FEI number, the submitter must enter 10 nines in that field, which will allow the form to be finalized. The submitter must also indicate the facility's readiness for inspection by checking the appropriate yes or no box and filling in the date field if appropriate. Although the complete instructions for Form 3938 are not yet available, they do include an instruction for Field 9 to specifically not enter facilities for packing, packaging materials unless a sterile process is involved or excipients. This question refers to reference DMFs, what we also like to refer to as secondary DMFs. Should we contain cross-reference DMF information consistently through all DMF submissions? Is it also true in annual reports? Yes, the current information on cross-reference DMFs should be included on the form for each submission, including annual report submissions. This question refers to field seven, submission types. Can I select submission type annual report and also select letter of authorization. 
Yes, it is a common submission scenario to submit annual reports with letters of authorization, and the form will allow both submission types to be selected simultaneously when this occurs. This question asks about the required use of DMF Form 3938. Will FDA advise in advance to all DMF holders and U.S. agents about when Form 3938 is mandatory? Or should they frequently check with the DMF website by themselves? FDA will post the final form and instructions when they are available for use, and folks should continue to check the FDA DMF website regularly. It is not our intent to reject submissions not including the form until industry has had sufficient time to adapt to the new form. FDA will provide ample notification as to the timing of when the form becomes a required element of DMF submissions. This question is about the location of the form in the ECTD format. Which section in ECTD should Form 3938 be contained? Is it Section 1.2 cover letters? The form should be located in Module 1 under Section 1.1, Forms. Since there are no required fillable forms associated with DMFs, this section is typically not used, but is routinely populated with required forms, such as the 356H in application submissions. This is where Form 3938 should reside. This question has to do with facilities. Should all the outside testing facilities used for testing the drug substance be listed in Form 3938? The form should list manufacturing facilities and testing facilities that perform routine release and stability testing. Facilities that perform non-routine characterization or other studies should not be listed on the form and just listed in Section 3.2.S.2.1 in the body of data. This is another question on the topic of facilities. Since the form now captures the DMF facility information, can the facility information related to the DMF be removed from the 356H form provided in the referencing application? What if there is a conflict between the 3938 and the 356H forms? Form 3938 does not change the requirement for facility information for the drug substance to be provided to the applicant and included in their 356H form. Any discrepancies between the facilities included in the DMF and those listed in the application are caught during the TCIR process and communicated in an IR to the applicant. Please see the talk by Jayani Pereira on the TCIR, TCIR process for details. Hi, my name is Wei Qing Jiang, and this question is from poster number five on the topic of CoCrystal API recommended documentation. The question is, when the reference listed drug substance coformer is hydrochloride, can generic drug substance use hydrobromide as coformer instead? In other words, are hydrobromide or hydrochloride as coformer interexchangeable? The answer to the question depends on if reference list drug substance is hydrochloride salt or it is a cold crystal. If the reference list drug substance is hydrochloride salt, then from a regulatory perspective, hydrochloride and hydrobromide cannot be interchanged in the context of a generic drug based on Orange Book definition of pharmaceutical equivalence. However, if the pharmaceutical solid qualifies as a co-crystal, then it is essentially an API excipient combination, and the co-former can be different in a generic drug. Please note that both hydrochloride and hydrobromide are strong acids, so both tend to form salts and are unlikely to form co-crystals. Hello, my name is Bapu Gadat. 
the question is from poster number 6 synthetic therapeutic polymers recommended documentation for api sms the question is what is the totality of the evidence approach what is the approach for this complex apis to show api sms where traditional methods won't work due to the properties it may not be possible to characterize entire molecule with in a single analytical method. Each structural fragment is analyzed with different techniques and compared with the structural fragment of RLA. <coughs> so orthogonal characterizations are required to fully characterize the complex API. In addition to the orthogonal characterization, the enhanced manufacturing process development is also used to identify critical quality attributes of the API and establish functional relationships of raw material attributes and process parameters to critical quality attributes of API. Since the identification of impurities in the final API is challenging, appropriate controls for impurities may be needed the starting materials, intermediates, and other raw materials used in the process to avoid formation of side products. Additionally, in vitro biological and functional assays are used to establish the API sameness. The justification of methods used for characterization is needed where required. To establish the API sameness of complex APIs, the totality of evidence approach is used. In this approach, the sufficient structural signature analysis, manufacturing process information, and functional data are compared to demonstrate the quality of the API is highly similar to the API in RLD. Hello, my name is Ram Randar. I'll be answering some of the questions we received for poster seven. Synthetic peptide APIs of generic complex drug products, recommendation for API sameness and related impurities. So this question relates to co eluting impurities. Question reads, for the impurities that are common between the drug substance and RLD, any suggestion for the acceptance criteria if more than one impurity was co-eluted at same retention time? A response. If the baseline separation of the co-eluted peak could not be achieved, indeed, other orthogonal approaches such as develop a different analytical method, utilize LCMS extracted iron chromatogram, to identify and quantitate each individual co-eluting impurity with a different mass in both your drug substance and the RLD samples. If the co-eluting impurities are isomeric, an upstream control in your manufacturing process may be appropriate. A detailed report documenting efforts along with justification should be included in the DMF for review. Next question seeks clarification of impurity limit. Could you please clarify if for new impurity the limit to apply is not more than 0.5? five zero percent or not more than 0.5 percent as provided under line 243 
of the draft guidance. Response. FDA draft guidance for industry and uh, for highly and uh, for certain highly purified synthetic peptide drug products that refer to listed drug of recombinant DNA origin. Guidance provides for establishing the active ingredient sameness and related impurity profile studies of your proposed synthetic peptide drug that refers to the RLD of recombinant DNA origin. With respect to the related impurities limit, the guidance recommends that the impurity limit generally be specified based, on, based upon comparative studies between RLD and proposed product and or safety evaluation. Please be advised that this guidance is not yet finalized and it is still under the comment period and you can submit your comments. Our best thinking at this point is that the new peptide related impurity limit should not exceed 0.50% to support proposed new impurity or higher impurity limit than the RLD an appropriate justification should be provided. Next question for poster seven is in the area of characterization. Question, please confirm that for API characterization and same niche studies, one API batch is enough. Additionally, as far as sameness is concerned, please also confirm that one RLD batch can be considered adequate. Response, yes. For API characterization and sameness studies, agency recommends that you perform a comparative studies on at least one batch of your proposed API and one batch of RLD. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ke Duo Qian, and this question is from poster number eight on topic of manufacturing in fermentation related products and asks if starting material is manufactured using fermentation, what are the additional requirements to be provided in comparison with starting material manufactured using regular chemical synthesis? Or if starting material upstream intermediate are manufactured using fermentation, but the final intermediate is manufactured using chemical synthesis, what are the additional requirements in comparison with the whole process just using chemical synthesis? Or if the API itself are manufactured using fermentation, what are the additional requirements to be provided in comparison with regular chemical synthesis? Please note ICHQ-11 on development and manufacture of drug substances and its Q&A document represent the agency's current thinking on the selection of regulatory starting materials for APIs. This actually includes semi-synthetic API as well as APIs manufactured by fermentation process. If the regulatory starting material of an API is manufactured by fermentation, then the brief manufacturing process description as well as the reagents and solvents used in the process should be provided. If the API is semi-synthetic or the API itself is manufactured by fermentation, then the source microorganisms might be appropriate to be considered as the regulatory starting material. In such cases, the following information should be provided if applicable. For example, the microorganism used for production, such as the species and the strain type, and the description of the origin of the source material or the isolate. A brief description of the procedures used to generate the cell bank system, 
such as the master cell bank and the working cell bank, as well as the criteria used for qualification should be provided. The following information should be included as appropriate, such as the process controls in the preparation, the storage conditions and retest expiry date, which should be supported by the appropriate data, procedures used in testing to determine the culture purity and to ensure the absence of contamination should be provided as well. This question is also on the topic of manufacturing in fermentation-related products and asks, what are the requirements for TSE and BSE compliance for fermented starting material, intermediate, or API? The applicant should provide a list of the media components used at each stage of the fermentation process, say if applicable. All the animal-derived components should be identified, and appropriate mitigation steps should be taken to ensure compliance that potential risk of transmitting TSE, BSE be mitigated. Hello, my name is Thomas O'Connor, and this question is from poster nine on quality considerations for continuous manufacturing of APIs on the topic of batch sizes. The question asks, if a manufacturer changes the batch size for an API produced by continuous manufacturing, what are the recommended actions to approve this type of change? A range of justified batch sizes can be submitted in an application. For example, the registered batch size could be between 10 and 50 kilograms of produced material. The recommended action would depend upon whether or not the proposed change is within the firm's control strategy. Please know that some failure modes may only be present during longer run times, such as due to contamination of material, accumulation of material, fouling, etc. If the proposed batch size is beyond the currently defined capability, the supplier should file a supplement to update the application. The type of supplement, PS, CB30, CB0, etc., would depend on whether or not the change in batch size is regarded as a major, moderate, or minor change. Factors include, include product specific risk factors, the extent of the change, i.e., going from run times of hours to months, and what is being changed. If throughput is being changed as part of the change in batch size, this would impact the process dynamics and potentially impact other elements of the control strategy. On behalf of all the poster presenters, thank you for listening to the answers to your questions. You can continue to view the posters and ask questions by using the link on the workshop poster page. We'll accept questions until March 19th for inclusion in the poster Q&A session in the follow-on webinar on April 9th.